Today, we left off last time with the seven bowls, the seven plagues of God. And again, we found there's parallelism in Revelation where you have one section that conveys the same thing, another section that conveys the same thing, and now we're going to start another section that conveys a similar thing, but each one puts an emphasis on something different. Are you with me right here? And so we're going to start off in Revelation 17, and the title of the lesson is simply Jesus' words he cried out on the cross. It is finished. Because now we're coming, and we're going to end with the end of the world. Amen? Let's go to Revelation chapter 17 and verse 8, verse 1. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wines of her adulteries. Hey, Josh, can you help me raise this pulpit a little bit? Thank you so much. Verse 3 says, Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, and an abomination to the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Then the angel said to me, Why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and yet will come out of the abyss and go to its destruction. The inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast, because it once was, now is not, and will come. This calls in mind with wisdom. The seven heads are the seven hills on which the woman sits. There are seven kings, five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is the eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. The ten horns you saw are the ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose, and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the lamb, but the lamb will triumph over them, because he is lord of lords and king of kings, and with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into the hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to hand over the beast, their royal authority, until God's words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Chapter 18, verse 1. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen! Fallen is Babylon the Great! She has become a dwelling for demons, and a hunt for every impure spirit, a hunt for every unclean bird, a hunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her cup. Give her as much torment and grief as glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit enthroned as a queen. I am not a widow. I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine 
she will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. This is intense. We find in this passage, using some pretty explicit language here, of this prostitute who's sitting on this beast and is given the name mother of all prostitutes, Babylon the Great. Now we know the ancient city Babylon was a city that was known to sit by waters. And we find Revelation interprets itself here. It says that the waters are the nations. The waters are the languages. The beast we are introduced to again. Now, we studied out already what the beast is. We studied out the ten horns and the seven heads. So if you want to get into all that, you've got to go back on YouTube and listen to the series. Amen? Amen. But we know that the beast represents the evil empire that's against God. In their time, this would have been Rome. Amen? And so the seven heads would represent seven empires that were against God in the past. You've got ancient Babel, you know, around the Tower of Babel, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Amen? And then he goes, you know, we studied out loud in previous chapters an eighth empire that's not yet and will come. Are you with me right here? And now we have as well, the seven heads also represent seven kings. And the ten horns also represent ten rulers. And again, I'm just calling on your memory here. Remember we said there were ten Caesars from Augustus on. And then we talked about how there were three that people debate are Caesars, and those three were moved to make seven. And so the Bible just covers them both, seven and ten. Are you with me right here? Again, you got to go back and listen to the series if you want to get into that. It's interesting because this prostitute, this beast, they, she sits on the beast, and it sits on the seven hills. Rome was known as the city of, on seven hills, amen? Of course, seven hills is a reminder, seven mountains it can be translated, and a mountain is a kingdom, referring to the seven empires that have been against God's people. And so we get to learn, what is this? Well, verse 18 reveals to us who the woman is. And verse 18, it says, the woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. But well, what city would that be, guys, at this time? Rome. So we find that the beast is the Roman Empire in this time, and the prostitute would be Imperial Rome, the capital city, if you will. Now, in 2 Peter, if you'll just look over there real quick. So just getting into some Bible study, and then we'll get practical, like that. In 2 Peter... We find uh, at the very end, uh, 1 Peter, excuse me, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 13, it says, She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, so does my son Mark. Now, any history buffs out there, is Babylon in existence at this point? No. Babylon was a code name for Rome back then. Because remember, you, you get in danger if you just kind of, you know, persecute Rome in some letter or something. And so Babylon was a code term for any evil empire. This is actually used throughout the Bible uh, about any empire that's against God. Because in God's mind, it goes way back to the Tower of Babel. And you'll notice there's actually an inference in this passage. If you look down in Revelation chapter 18, go back over there. And in verse 4, it says, Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. Verse 5, for her sins are piled up to heaven, wow. and God has remembered her crimes. Well, the sin of ancient Babel was that they built this tower that reached to the heavens, and God had to intervene and stop it because they were building a kingdom to themselves when God wanted them to spread out and bring his message to the world. Amen? And here he infers on that. He goes, listen, you evil empire Babylon, your sins have piled up, and the judgment is coming. And that is also a concept we find in the Bible with the Amorites in the Old Testament. Or it's this, this idea that God, at some point, the sins are just too much. They pile up to heaven, if you will, to use that visual. And God goes, enough's enough. Yeah. Judgment has come. Well, this prostitute astonishes John. He says in chapter 17, in verse 6, when I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Remember, John's like seeing this movie that, like, breaks down, if you will, if you look at all these images that breaks down what's happening in their time. And he's so astonished, and the angel goes to him, well, why are you astonished? 
Why are you shocked by this? Isn't it interesting when we go through persecution, we get kind of shocked by it? You ever see someone like post something online about the church or something, and you're just like, oh my gosh, I'm shocked by this. I'll never forget the first time I got persecuted. I share with you guys, you know, I was just like, I was like, I, I was scared. I read this, this website that broke down all this stuff about the church. I was talking about, yeah, they use these Bible studies to brainwash you, and they manipulate you, and this is a cult, this is what they do. And this is why the kingdom is not really the church. And all this kind of gymnastics theologically. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I remember going to church that next Sunday. Or actually it was at a Friday devotional. And I'm just kind of looking at everyone suspiciously. You know what I mean? Like, is this real? You guys are all so happy and it's strange. And then I remember we had a church building at, uh, back then in Kansas. I remember going in the fellowship hall and just, <coughs> and a guy named Denny's, our youth minister at the time, was kind of like, what, what's wrong? And I'm just like, well, you know, I'm just scared. I felt fear that I've been, you know, I'm, I'm, maybe this isn't real, whatever. And he was like, well, is there anything that is not in the Bible or anything? Has this been your experience, what you've read? Yeah. And I was like, no. <laughs> he goes, and then that just helped me. I was like, that just got to get back to the Word of God, man. Yeah. And, and yet, sometimes we can be astonished when we see these evil attacks against God's people. Yeah. And here John's astonished. And I just imagine the writer's like, the angel's like, dude, like, you don't get it by now? We've been through all this crazy stuff here in Revelation. I mean, it's going to be crazy, amen? amen? And I believe we haven't even begun to experience it. We haven't even begun to experience it. People go, oh. Oh, there's some TV show now out there about the church or whatever. It, it's like, dude, of course. And there's going to be more. And there'll be documentaries made about us. There'll be things that are out there. And you've got to be ready. If we are truly going to evangelize the world, Babylon's going to attack. And it will come. John's astonished, but we need to remember, as Peter says in 1 Peter 4, don't be surprised as if something strange is happening to you when you're persecuted. For those of us that are new Christians in the church and recently been baptized, we need to know that you'll be persecuted. You're going to be attacked those first 40 days in different ways. Maybe from family, and maybe from friends, and maybe through slander of the church you're now part of. It may be through an old relationship coming back into your life. But understand, persecution will come because Satan's goal is to take you out. Interestingly, it's um, at the end of Revelation uh, 17, something happens. That is a concept that we also find throughout uh, Revelation. It talks about how the prostitute who sits on the beast literally goes against the beast. And they devour each other. It says in verse 16, the beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. And they will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. You say, what's going on here? I thought these guys were like a team or something. Well, they were initially, but the, the, the nature of wickedness is that it's self-destructive. Yeah. Because you have all these jealous people, you know what I mean? All these nations looking to, to imperial Rome, trying to, trying to use them, trying to sleep in bed with them, if you will. To enjoy its luxuries and to enjoy its blessings. And then, of course, you have other people that get jealous of the emperor. You have wars that break out. And, and the idea is that it's going to implode, and that's exactly what happens. But we understand, we learn from that in our own lives, that when we hang out with sinners, the world is going to leave you empty. You're going to be stabbed in the back. You're not going to have great relationships because they are not restrained by the Holy Spirit. They don't have God in their lives. And so Rome would become self-destructive. And, and that's what this is about. The beast, the empire would begin to hate imperial Rome. Some commentators believe the prostitute represents uh, uh, papal Rome or what we would call the Catholic Church. Wow. Um, and it's the idea that, once again, similarly, and it's debated which one it is, but the same concept is that they all looked to papal Rome for its spiritual authority, and it ended up becoming the destruction of what was known as true Christianity. And so, whether religious, political, we need to understand that when we live in sin, it's going to be the end of us. Wow. And it's going to be the end of relationships. That's why there's divorce in the world. That's why there's abuse in the world. I mean, all kinds of horrific things happen. And the Bible calls us in chapter 18, verse 4, come out from this. Yeah. 
Come out from Babylon. Don't share in her sins. Don't let them pile up in your life by building your own kingdom like they did in the Tower of Babylon. And the Bible says that this prostitute had this cup, gold on the outside, all these jewels adorned with precious, precious stones. That means she looks good, seductive. That's the world. It looks good. And you go, man, I want that cup. What drinks in that gold thing? And it says it's just wickedness that's in there. And you know, I love it. The Bible says in verse 5, or verse uh, after that, it says, God pours out from her own cup, which contained the wickedness, to destroy the prostitute and Rome. Again, God's going to use sin to destroy people. We talked about last time, sin's built in punishments. And by its very nature, sometimes God doesn't have to like strike a lightning bolt down on you. Just goes, well, judging himself, I guess. I don't have to do anything. Because he's going to be a drug addict. He's going to be a drunkard. This person's going to become a sex addict now. And get into even more perverted things. This person's going to go to jail. By nature, sin is destructive. Wow. You know, in chapter 18, uh, they announced that Babylon has fallen. And this would have encouraged the early Christians because it's showing, hey, this is all going to come down. Just You don't have to share it. Don't, don't put your stock in this thing. Don't, don't invest your heart into this empire. It will all come down. You know, we find after chapter 18, I mean, so many great verses. Verse 10 says, the hour of your doom has come. And again, this doesn't just represent Rome. It's for all Christians of all time. And you're going to see in here what scholars call double references. It's the idea that one day, Jesus is going to come back. It's going to happen in one hour. It's going to happen quick. And everything's going to be done. Are you with me right here? All the Babylonian empires. Remember, the seven heads represent just all the kingdoms. The per all the perfect, if you will, that's what seven means, the complete anti-Christian kingdoms against God will come to doom. Well, we find that the city falls and the finality in verse 21 talks about the great violence in the city. It talks about all the musicians and the harpists won't be heard from anymore. And then we pick up in chapter 19 and verse 1. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting. I mean, they're fired up in heaven, amen? Yeah. And you remember they had the, the souls that were under the altar that had been killed? Yeah. And they're like, when's our blood going to be avenged? You know, get these gods. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, and, and the reality is God goes, listen, be patient. It's going to come. But now it's come. Babylon's fallen. And they go, hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For true and just are his judgments. He's condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders, remember those guys? And the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne. And they cried, amen, hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, praise our God, all you servants who fear him both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. At this I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you. And with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. I saw heaven standing open. And there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Again, fine linen being the righteous acts. These were the righteous people who had made it to heaven. Amen? Verse 15, coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, 
King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried out in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings and generals and the mighty of horses and their riders and all the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Amen. Now, that's a pretty graphic picture, but as Christians, we're going to be fired up, amen? Our Lord returns, and the beast is done. They, they, they try to set up to make war against him, and, and God's just like, he captures them and throws them all the fire, amen? Again, there's no end-time galactic war. It's going to last years or anything like this. They're like, no, you can't stand against the Lord Jesus Almighty, amen? And he throws the beast, and again, these are symbols, right? The beast is a symbol of the evil people that were not with God. They're thrown into hell. And, of course, the prostitute thrown into hell. The people that wage war against God. Now, we find white. They return on these white horses representing the purity, the fine linen, the righteousness of God. And, of course, the sword coming out of Jesus' mouth, the word of God, amen, amen. that convicts and moves. And I pray today we're reading a lot of scripture. And sometimes it's just good to read scripture in church. Yeah. And you got to open your heart and say, am I allowing the word of God, the sword of the spirit, as it's called in Ephesians 6, to change me today? Or is this just going to be another church service where I go, eh, I learned some cool things about Revelation and whatever. No, you want to change. The Word of God is here to change you today, amen? And if you're visiting with us, we're a church that believes that the Bible has the final authority, amen? amen. Now, let's see what happens here in Revelation 20, verse 1. Again, we're just going to read a little bit here. Then I have three kind of like short charges. In chapter 20 and verse 1, this is a passage that's confused a ton of people. And how this passage is interpreted is how you interpret Revelation, the entire book. So in chapter 20, verse 1, before I get into it, uh, remember biblical numerology? Anyone remember what a thousand represents? An era. An era. A complete era. Good job. That's awesome. In chapter 20, verse 1, it says, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding it in his hand, in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw the thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. Well, we have here Satan, the dragon. Of course, he is the one that empowered the beast and empowered the false prophet, that unholy trinity. And remember, the beast we saw last time was a little different as that it was dressed in scarlet, red. The same as the dragon was described in Revelation 12. And so Satan is the one who empowers the beast and evil in this world. We need to understand we're in a spiritual war. Yeah. We need to understand as Christians that even right now there's a battle for your hearts in this yeah. world. Yeah. And I don't totally claim to understand it all, uh, but there's the demonic and then there's the angelic. And there's a war going on. Yeah. God's plan is for you to walk out of here change. God's plan is for visitors to walk away wanting to study the Bible, wanting to be saved. Satan's plan is for you to be distracted. Satan's plan is to just be thinking about Burger King after this or, or whatever. <laughs> Satan's plan is for you to leave here unchanged. That, that's the plan. There's, there's always two plans. you got to always ask yourself, which one am I living? God's plan or Satan's plan? Come on. And so the devil is, is a real force. Now, 
it's interesting in this vision, the devil is then bound for a thousand years, for a complete era. And so what's that mean? Well, what was he bound from? The, the, the verse tells us, it says in verse 2, he bound him for a thousand years and locked a seal over him. And then it says that if you drop down, Oh, there it is, verse 3. It says, He threw him into the abyss and locked a seal over him to keep him from deceiving the what? The nations anymore until a thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. So he's put on a chain, if you will, almost like a dog on a short leash, from deceiving the nations. Remember, at this time was the only time we know of in history where the entire world, known world, was against Christianity. And so this if you will, uh, Satan is, is bound from deceiving the nations, and this prophesies the fall of Rome. Wow. So Rome, of course, fell in 476 AD, and since that time, there's never been a worldwide effort against Christianity. Certainly there's been persecutions and large persecutions, but then he goes, he's bound, he's on this short lease, he's still the prince of the air, he can direct the demon, you know, he's, remember, these are all symbols. And yet, there's going to be a day where he's released for a short time. And that's the beast that's to come. Are you with me right here? I don't know, again, what that means. People try, oh, it's the European Union, you know, it's the, the, the this or that, or it's Islam, it's the Middle East, but whatever. Don't, don't, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, it's just saying, in my Bible, it's the entire world. And so, everyone's going to be against Christianity one day, but it's a short time. And he re emphasizes that short time like he does in the rest of Revelation, because that inspires those going through the hardships. That encourages us. He says the ones that don't have to worry so much from an eternal perspective, you find these souls that the Bible says have been slain, and they were beheaded, and they're reigning with Christ. And he says these are the ones that have experienced the first resurrection. They've come alive. And then he goes, after the thousand years are completed, there's going to be another resurrection. We need to figure out what's this talking about because verse 6 says, Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. So we know that someone that's blessed, someone that's holy, someone that's going to end up on the final day of resurrection is someone who's been baptized. And so well, scholars agree that this is most likely, uh, conservative scholars, uh, referring to the baptism. Because that's our first resurrection that we all can participate in. And some people go, well, it says they, come, they came to life, though. Well, yeah, when you get baptized, you're made alive with Christ, amen? amen? And God sees us unified with those souls that have already passed, that have been unified. That's the first resurrection. I've got to ask, if you're visiting with us, have you experienced the first resurrection? Say, so, well, I prayed Jesus into my heart, so I'm a Christian. I go, well, no, that's not what the Bible says. Look at Romans chapter 6. Come on, bro. In Romans chapter 6, and again, people, you know, uh, trying to fight against baptism being necessary to salvation. It's the weirdest thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's very weird if you just read the New Testament. Right. There is no example of a Christian who was not baptized. Yeah. It's just not in there. There's no example of a baby being baptized right. or a child being baptized. You go, I was baptized, you know, I did my first communion and all this stuff. Is that in the Bible? Right. Right. That's what we got to ask. In Romans chapter 6, in verse 3, Paul writes to the church, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life in the church says. Amen. Now look at the next verse. We sometimes don't pay attention to this in verse 5. For if we've been united with him in a death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like this. Amen. Amen. Listen, the only way you can be united with Christ is by being baptized yeah. into his death. And the Bible says through faith, of course, you contact the blood of Christ because that's when he died. And you participate, you've been first resurrected. Amen. amen. The spiritual resurrection. Amen. He goes, you're blessed. You're holy. You're going to make it. Amen. amen. And then he says, of course, then there's the last resurrection, which we'll see at the end of Revelation here. But where the dead are physically raised in the sense of we get transformed new bodies. Amen. Is that pretty cool? And we'll talk about that more next, next week. 
Now, if you go back to Revelation chapter 20, making sense so far? Yeah. A lot of symbolism here, a lot of, you know, things that are complicated. Um, but I think it's, it's all, for me, it's always fun, you know what I mean, to look into it. And uh, we find that he says, blessed are those, the second death in verse 6 has no power over them. And he says, but they will be priests of God, and Christ will reign with them for a thousand years. Brothers and sisters, Christ is reigning with us right now. This thousand years, we're in that era. Wow. That hasn't completed yet. This is just simply talking about the kingdom, amen? If we study this in the kingdom study. Uh, it's not like Jesus is not reigning right now or something like that. Like, no, there's a, a thousand year period that we're in, just meaning a complete era, remember? And then in verse 7, it says, When the thousand years that complete era is over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth. God and Magog, which comes from Ezekiel 38. Those are just two uh, evil kings, if you will. That's just using them as symbols again, like all of Revelation has. Some people have tried to break this down to say it's Russia or, or whatever. Again, that, that totally contradicts the, the entire way the Bible uses the Old Testament in Revelation. Yeah. And so, again, it's just symbols of, of evil empires. Could it be Russia? Possibly. I don't know. But I should make it the point that all of the evil empire, all of this unified world is going to come against Christianity. He says he gathers them for battle and number. They are like sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. This is, of course, a symbol of the church. God's people. Come, we're not in a physical kingdom anymore. But he uses this, this army comes and surrounds. Go, oh, here's the great battle. Well, let's read what happens. Verse 9. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who has deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever. I fire you up. Come on. Guys, I'm fired up. Satan's got coming in. What's wrong with you guys? You sad? Satan? I want Satan to change. I saw someone have stats the other day, you know, you got to preach so hard that Satan repents. I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, amen. Whoever preached that, I love you, you know. But, but I was just like, what are you talking about? Like, we, we, we are going to have victory over this. This guy's been tormenting us forever. I mean, thousands and thousands of years. That's going to be an awesome day when evil is vanquished and done away with. We find in verse 7, or verse 11, excuse me. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown in the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Well, this is the final day of judgment. No one's going to miss this meeting. No one's going to be late to this one. And I don't know what it's going to be like, but, you know, I imagine if you're not right with the Lord, it's going to be a very scary day. Right. I always, for whatever reason, picture, you know, a long line. And there's certain people I want to stand by in that line, you know what I mean? Like, like there's just certain brothers that are, and sisters that, you know, just the moral support as we're getting closer <laughs> for our turn. <laughs> and the books are going to be opened. And you're going to find out whether your name was in the book of life or not. And we're going to, is the Lord returning right now? <laughs> Crazy. Amen. Amen. Hope you had a good communion. Amen. Let's go. We're ready to go. Here we find it's finished. The, the, the end of an era. And a new era and a new life's going to begin that we're going to talk about. And next week's going to be very inspiring. We're going to study out heaven. Come on. Come on. But, but now judgment has come. I've got three charges for us that I just simply want us to glean from what we studied today. Uh, one, we need to understand Babylon is finished. Two, self is finished. And three, this age is finished. One, Babylon is finished. You know, we saw the verse that says, come out from her. Don't share in the empire's sins. You know, for us guys, there's the American dream. And there's what this world system tells us that we're to value. 
And often what people are valuing is, of course, having a good time. But this hedonism teaches that we've got to live the most comfortable life possible. Whatever brings me pleasure. And this is a foreign concept to the scriptures that I hope we've seen by this point in Revelation. And so we have to come out of what the world idolizes. Sometimes even as Christians. And the name of maturity, like I talked about last week. We can think that, you know, we really want to have good lives. And I, certainly the Bible teaches we should make the gospel attractive. But in the name of that, we can't drift into the American dream, into being another denominational church for the false message. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Are you finished with Babylon? Are you just finished with the world? I, you know, I'm, I hate this world. Like, I, I really do. I mean, I'm just done with it. You know what I mean? Now, Ecclesiastes says to enjoy the good things of it. Amen. Everything that's good comes from God. So I do enjoy the fact that we have freedom. I, you know, I, 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 I love America in that sense. I love studying out American history, all that. But I would say, at the end of the day, I don't really care. Like, I just want to be in heaven with God. And I want to see this world restored to what it was in the time of the Garden of the Eden. And that's what the Bible is saying. Babylon's finished. This isn't something you carry in your hearts. I like 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And we're going to look at verse 14. It says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and the ill? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and of idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves. From everything that contaminates body, spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence from God and the church says, Amen. You know, how do you come out of Babylon? How do you come out of the world? Does this mean we need to go move into the desert somewhere and just kind of huddle together? <laughs> Certainly not. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. And it's important to understand that the way we come out from Babylon is we need to evaluate our relationships. We need to evaluate who influences us. We need to evaluate our convictions even on dating. Amen, singles? You know, in the church we teach, like the Bible teaches, that we're not to be yoked with unbelievers. A yoke being a harness that held animals together so if one animal went that way, it influenced the other one. And one of the ways the enemy gets people sucked back into Babylon is by them flirting with the world. Flirting with someone who's not a true disciple of Jesus. Well, they read their Bible at work and have morning devotions and stuff. Amen. But they're not part of the church. And at the end of the day, don't you want to be with someone who's as passionate about what you're passionate about? I mean, even from just a psychological standpoint, you take the Bible out of the picture, it makes no sense to date and marry someone who goes to a different church than you. And you've got to understand that I'm not part of this church just because it's the best church in the city. I actually think there's like better churches from a secular standpoint. Yeah. Okay. Better production, better singers, sorry, I'm not gonna, you know, better. <laughs> you know what I mean? And Mike is really good. But you know, guys know what I'm talking about. Churches celebrities go to and all this kind of stuff. And it's kind of like Babylon, you know, you just all the jewels and the gold and all that kind of stuff. But they look no different than the world. They look no different than the world. I'm part of this church because of truth. Not because of, you know, whatever, you meet in you know, school for crying out loud, you know what I'm saying? Like, th th this, is, this is because of what the Bible says. So I'm going to ask you, do you have a conviction that you're going to date only Christians? Do you have a conviction? Well, I don't see anyone I'm attracted to in the church. Well, amen, then reach out to someone and bring them to church and let them study and get baptized. But you know, if they don't study, if they do study and they say, I don't want this, or they even persecuted or something, are you one of these dumb Christians who can be like, oh man, maybe something is wrong, and follow them outside the church? Or are you going to have conviction from the Bible that I can't be yoked together with people that don't have faith? And it's conviction. I mean, when we study the Bible with people, we tell them, you know, if they're dating a non Christian, they can't even get baptized. God says they got to repent, and plus he says, listen, I'll be their father in this passage if they come out and be separate. I'm really excited about Mecca and Lucia's wedding coming. Yeah. And I appreciate 
Lucia's conviction, eventually I'm not going to have the conviction, but, but I appreciate when she studied the Bible and she said, listen, we got to become separate. And, you know, we all had our struggles. It wasn't perfect. But she goes, I, we got to be separate. Yeah. And then Emeka said, okay, what is she into? <laughs> I always remember when Sarah came over to get baptized at her house, and uh, Emeka was just kind of standing there like. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, yeah, I want to study with you about this baptism thing. He was religious. He had his own Bible study group and everything. But we went to, into it, and, you know, he saw the truth. And he came out of false Babylon and came into the kingdom of God. And what's awesome is they have the character to go, you know what, we can't just start dating all of a sudden, because right when he comes out the water or whatever. Like, like they go, you know something, we, we want to build this on God. And I appreciate their convictions, their fight to be pure. And when that she comes down in that white dress, that's going to mean something. They have dated in the world. But to them, God made the new creations. And in God's eyes, that's going to be the first time that they're together. You know, a wedding in our church is a meeting of the body. Yeah. We, 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 we don't, oh, well, I don't really know them that well. No, they're part of our spiritual family. Yeah. And we have a conviction. Do we, are we going to be there to support them and yeah. be at the wedding? Yeah. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's exciting when, when love's in the church. I, I'm excited. We're, we're going to try to go to uh, Janine's wedding <laughs> in Florida. I understand not everyone can, you know, do that. But, but um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 33, you guys still with me here? Yeah, yeah. come on, bro. It says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God, and I say this to your shame. Is Paul just like direct or what? Yeah. Just stop sinning. <laughs> I love it. Just stop. And he goes, bad company corrupts good character. Here's the thing. You're going to become like who you spend time around the most. Yeah. Bottom line, you're a product of who you spend time around. So here's the question. Do you spend more time around disciples or the world? Talk about it, bro. And even Jesus taught in Mark 3 that the spiritual family is prioritized above the physical family. Right. That's Jesus. That's not something I made up. Yeah, yeah. You know, this church believes that. No, this is something the Bible teaches. Yeah. Even spending time around our non-Christian families more than disciples can really impact us. Yeah. And we all have to be humble here. We all have to realize, guys, that we're all easily persuaded. Pe yeah. People, as a human race, we are fickle. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen the greatest men of God that I go, wow, this guy would never fall away. Fall and totally depart from the truth. Yeah. And the fruit is evident in their life. Yeah. Yeah. Now, right now, the church is undergoing a lot of persecution online, on social media in particular. And when we can't be faked out by this stuff, and the fruit's evident. These people are vicious, and they don't, and you'll notice all the leaders in our churches don't even respond, or if they do, it's in love, yeah. and there's a spirit of fruit there. Right. But you'll notice the people that are persecuting, I mean, I've seen, like, they've made videos making fun of us, yeah. and kind of snippeting sermons out and saying this is, you know, what they believe, or taking the worst part somebody said, like, we're all perfect or something, and never... You know, said something stupid. You know, I've said a lot of stupid things up here, amen? And they love to take those things and put them online and go, this is how terrible this church is, you know, or whatever. But, but we can't be faked out by Babylon, guys. Yeah. We're in a spiritual war. Yeah. Who you spend time on with on social media will determine what you're like. Yeah. What do I mean by that? What pages you follow what you constantly look at and put yeah. into you, yeah. it will influence you. Yeah. And so you have a conviction. You know, we used to call it back in the day, uh, spiritual pornography. <laughs> just, just garbage you look into and this sort of thing. And, and you know, I, I'm not a big fan of that term, but, but I think I understand the point being made. Is that this stuff can pollute you. <laughs> Babylon is finished, guys. It's gotta be finished in our hearts yeah. because it's gonna be finished one day. If you look back in Revelation chapter 18, Who's your circle of friends? Who are the people that are close to you? Even in the church. Sometimes, you know, I've been around for a long time, and little groups can form in the church, and, and they like they don't help each other. <laughs> there's kind of like three of the weakest brothers or three of the weakest sisters, you know what I mean? And they just kind of hang out and form their own clique, and sometimes just sit back, you know what I mean? And it's like, why don't you like seek out the spiritual people? It's okay to be weak spiritually. 
oh, wait, I've been weak spiritually, but don't you want to have some spiritual friends yeah. that, like, help you and influence you? You know, in Re uh, Revelation 18, uh, look at what happened here with, with Babylon. In chapter 18, verse 16, it says, Come on, Mike. They cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city, dressed in fine linen, purple, and scarlet, and glittering gold, and precious stones, and pearls. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain, and all who travel by ship, the sailors, and all who earn their living from the sea will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they'll exclaim, Was there ever a, a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads, and with weeping and mourning cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour, she has been brought to ruin. One of the things you'll see over and over again in these passages is the idea of wealth and luxury. And that's what seduced the disciples at the time. They denied Christ. And that's what's, what was seducing to the world. And so when we give in to greed, when we give in to that American dream of, I just want to be rich. Again, it's not a sin to make money. Not a sin to be rich. But it's a sin to love money. Right. It's a sin to not use it, your wealth, to build the kingdom of God. Yeah. And we need to ask ourselves, do we share in the sins of the American dream? Right. Of our modern day... Babylon. You know, I want to talk about special missions contribution for a moment right now. And I love special missions contribution. I'm so moved to seeing uh, so much of the good news. And it's just encouraging to go, wow, guys, we've been a part of this. Like, your money is literally saving souls around the world to support these churches, to support the travel of the people getting there to start the church. And it's amazing. You know, in March, our church has a goal of getting up to 30% of our special missions. I believe it's around $45,000. And I believe we can do it with faith. Yeah, right. I believe we can do it with faith. And so many of you have been generous, and maybe the Lord's even blessed you more. We're going to need some people to surpass their goal. I hope you don't limit yourself with just a goal that the church gives you. I hope if it's in your heart. Some people will not be able to hit the goal, but in their heart, they're generous. But at the end of the day, we've got to work together as a team. And money can be one of those funny things that, like sex, is hard to talk about. Just kind of like weird. Uh, money was a sore spot for me and my brother growing up. Well, I can't speak for him. I guess for, for me growing up. Uh, because, you know, my mom didn't have it. And it was hard for a period of time. Now she's doing good. But, but at the time, it was challenging. So there was a lot of strife about financial things growing up. And so for me, I, I'm, I'm one of those guys that I get stressed out opening up my bank account. Like, I don't even like it. And when I get a notification on the Bank of America icon, I'm like, <laughs> what did I forget about? You know what I mean? Or, or, or something. I, I just hate it. You know what I'm saying? But you know, as a Christian, I've got I've, I've to gotta engage it. Because my wealth is given to me to build the kingdom. Go to Luke chapter 16. Luke 16. That extra hour, man, that, that, that impacts you, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm struggling this morning, too. I snuck in the back so none of you guys could tell I was late. I was like, you know. But late, late for my time. Oh, you know, I be here. In Luke 16, in verse 8, there's a parable uh, told about a shrewd manager. And essentially, just to sum up for time, what happens is uh, this, this uh, guy is afraid because he realizes his job's about to end. And his job is debt collecting. And so he basically realizes he's wasted time and wasted resources. And so he gets smart. He goes, you know something? I'm going to go and I'm going to lower the debts of the people that owe money so that they'll pay back and my master will be happy. And you guys understand this. You ever had a debt collector that calls you and then you, maybe you owe $1,000 and they're like, you know what? Today if you pay $500, it will be done. Yeah. And so that's kind of what's happening here. And so, basically, then we pick up, he does this, and he says, hey, if you guys that I cancel your debt, if I cancel your debt at this low, pri low price, if I lose my job, can I stay with you? And, of course, back then, this was like a hospitable culture. And so, this is what Jesus says in verse 8. It says, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. We're in Luke 16, verse 8. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. 
Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. God expects us to use our wealth to win friends into the kingdom. Yeah. And he goes, if, if you can't be trustworthy in this matter, how am I going to trust you with true riches, with souls yeah. that come into the kingdom? And the Bible says, you know, I, I commend this, the world and their shrewdness, but, you know, they lie and they do things in a worldly way. He goes, shouldn't Christians then at least be strategic? Shouldn't Christians at least plan? Of course, he's not telling Christians to lie, I guess. Right. But he says, you've got to be shrewd. What's your plan for special missions? So that you can gain wealth to gain friends in all these countries that we see all around the world. Amen. The Pharisees, they sneered. What, what do you think sneering looks like? Give me your best sneering face. <laughs> Some of you guys aren't doing it. Amanda, let me see. There we go. Okay. But you know, we, we smile at church. We smile at church. But I just ask you, when I bring up special missions, what's your heart now? <sighs> Don't understand what I'm going through. Guys, we're all going through. We live in Boston for crying out loud. Rent is like ridiculous. And so we're all going through. So, amen. We're not in the American dream. We're in the kingdom dream. And the kingdom dream is one of sacrifice. Because we realize this is momentary. That Babylon will be finished one day. And it will come to an end. In your heart, have you determined to make special missions great? Have you owned your Bible talk school? Are you as a Bible talk, are you a family? And going, we're going to help each other be great in this sacrifice. My challenge is put it all, all in today if you have it. Just give it if it's sitting there. If you don't, come up with a plan. But be done with the things of Babylon, the things that the world values. For God says you'll either hate one or you'll love the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Amen. Yeah. You know, number two, self is finished. Self is finished. In Revelation 17, if you look at these uh, verses here, Revelation 17 and verse 6, Scripture says, I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. Now, remember what testimony means. It's a witness, a martyr. Remember, martyrdom in Revelation is not just dying for the faith. It's sharing your faith till the end. You're being a faithful witness. Amen? Amen. And the Bible says that the Babylon, the prostitutes, they were just drunk on the blood of those who were out evangelizing that were out preaching the word of God, sharing the testimony of Jesus, as our awesome sister Leah did today. Yeah. And praise God, we can share our testimonies openly, yeah. but we got to ask, are we sharing? And would we even share and be evangelistic in the face of death and threats? Yeah. Some of us can't even share our faith in our job because we're scared. Yeah, Some of us can't even share our faith with our Uber driver because we judge them and go, oh, they look like they wouldn't be open or whatever. Yeah. Would we be in this time Sharing the testimony. You see, self has to be finished. Yeah. My, my life is not considered. It's the life of others so that we can be in heaven together. In chapter 19, in verse 10, at this I fell at the feet of worship to him. But he said to me, don't, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it's the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. Well, 2 Peter 1, we know that scripture is prophecy. And we learned in our miraculous gift study at this time, prophecy was still in part, but once the word of God was finished, it would be complete. Yeah. And so the word of God bears testimony to Jesus. Amen? Amen. The Bible is to lead us to Jesus. The Bible is not just to lead us to study. It's to lead us to Jesus. And that's important because Jesus said, you Pharisees, you diligently study the law 
but you refuse to come to me. And so the word of God always needs to lead us back to the testimony of the cross. And when it does, we're going to share that with everyone. Yeah. We're going to be open with that about everyone we come into contact with. For self is finished and only Christ lives. In chapter 20, verse 4, I saw the thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of the God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received the mark on their foreheads and their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Again, they came to life. They experienced the first resurrection, and they didn't have the mark on their forehead and their hand. And we studied that out. You remember the mark of the beast? And these were the people that sold out to Rome. And go, I want to keep my wealth. I want to be rich. I want to be able to go to the quote-unquote grocery store back then. And, you know, market. And at the end of the day, they sold out to Rome and received the, the, the symbolic mark of the beast. But those who refused, they said, I'm going to preach Jesus in the face of death. I'm not going to receive that mark. I want my name written in the book of life. Let's go to Acts chapter 4 here. Hang in there with me for a few more minutes. In Acts chapter 4, and we're going to look in, uh, excuse me, Acts 2. Of course, the church starts in Acts 2 and verse 41. It says, those who accepted the message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. Amen? So 3,000 men, women, well, you know, they're just added to the church. And then if you look in chapter 4, verse 4, it says, but many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Amen? So were they lacking in men in the church? No. No. And, and we need more men in our congregation. Amen? Yeah. We need more men. And that's why I'm excited this Saturday we're having a men's breakfast. Amen? Amen? And we're inviting all of the men we know in the city to come. Our goal is to have one-for-one one guests. And it's going to be an awesome time as we really try to recapture manhood as it is in the Bible. Because we lost it. We've lost it. If you look in chapter 20, the world's lost it. Men have been feminized. A uh, lot, lot of men don't want to lead anymore. And it can't be like that in the church. You say, why are all the, the, the people preaching in the book of Acts always listed as men? Because men were the leaders. And they were to preach. Doesn't mean the women were lesser value or not one of those churches that they just need to shut up or whatever. That's, that's sinful as well. But we have different roles. It's kind of like, I'm not better than you just because I'm the minister of the church. Not at all. Uh, we are equal before the foot of the cross. I just have a different role than you do. And so it's the same in this male and female dynamic. Now, if you look in Acts 20, verse 22. It says, and now compelled by the Spirit. I'm going to Jerusalem and not knowing that what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship is facing me. <laughs> Thanks, Holy Spirit. <laughs> However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying the good news of God's grace. Was Paul done with self? Absolutely. Because I consider my, my life worth nothing. Guys, do you wake up ready to save souls? Is it the first thought on your mind? I know for me when I wake up, I just, you know, how can we advance the church? Sometimes i got to, like, make sure I have my quiet time first, you know what I mean, before I start, like, reaching out to people and all this kind of stuff. Um, for you, is, is it a passion? Is, are you done with self? You're just done with, with, with yourself. And this is life to the full. This is actually a more great, awesome life. Yeah. You know, for this Saturday, I want to encourage you to invite men to church. Now, what was women's role in the Bible? What's one word that maybe describes a woman's role? A helper. And you go, well, I'm not married, so, you know, that doesn't apply to me. Well, the church is the bride of Christ, guys. And hopefully the sisters are trained to be married, amen? If that's your goal, some are called not to. And so I want to encourage the women to help the men this week. To be a helper this week in bringing men to the men's forum, amen? Amen. Our awesome sister Jody Booth is going to be uh, in charge of the breakfast that morning. Yeah. And she's going to need a lot of help. And you know, men like to go to a place where there's women too. Amen. Kind of hard. There's going to be all guys there. You know what I mean? But, but when we have some awesome sisters there that are radiating the love of Christ. It's going to be a powerful event. But do you have a male friend coming? 
You know, I want to close with the final charge. This age is finished. Go to Revelation chapter 20. This, this age is finished. Jesus said it's finished on the cross. We know the outcome. When he said those words, sin, it was finished. Demonic powers, they were disabled. And yet, it all had to play out in what we know as history. And ultimately, the world's going to come to its end and be renewed. In Revelation 20 and verse 12, he talks about us all standing before judgment, as I explained earlier. And it says in verse 12 of chapter 20, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. What are we judged by when we stand before God? What we've done. We're judged by our deeds here. And there's these books that are open. One book, of course, the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. The other book shows our deeds and what we've done. And this is a message that's not popular in Christianity anymore. Go, well, it doesn't matter what you do. I don't know about you, but how can you read that and think it doesn't matter what you do? You're going to be judged by what you've done. Yeah. Now, I think of, you ever been to Times Square? Yeah. Uh, we're going to have a worship service in New York City uh, with all the Northeast churches May 7th. Amen? That's going to be exciting. So May 7th, you guys all have the calendar, so be sure you check these things. Uh, but imagine standing in Times Square and your light just starts playing on the, the big jumbotron thing there. <laughs> You're like, oh, I'm a cute baby. And then it starts, wait, we're going to teenage years? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. oh, no. The things in the done in the dark. And you're just like trying to turn it off. You're grabbing rocks and like trying to throw it at this thing. You know what I mean? And you're like, please don't. You know, I'm grateful for the lamb that was slain for us. Yeah. I'm grateful for Jesus who said it's finished. Because what's amazing is when you repent and turn to God, those things are removed. And your Titan Tron just shows all the good things you've done. Ezekiel 18, if you want to study that out. All the good things are remembered and the bad is forgotten. That's what I want to see on Judgment Day. But you've got to repent. Our deeds matter. Of course, 18 verse 4 said we must come out of sin. 19 verse 8 said the righteous acts of the saints are the final in it. Are you ready to stand before God today? Is your name written in the book of life? Revelation 3.5 says it can be blotted out. I heard a preacher say this one time. It's not the most encouraging thought. But he said, you know, I think the name is written in pencil so that it can be erased. This once saved, always saved garbage is false. Now, I believe we can be secure in our salvation. It's a whole other sermon. But the Bible warns us that you don't want your name blotted out from the book of life. Yeah. I want to close in 2 Peter chapter 3. The early Christians wrestled with, with when is this all going to happen? When is this going to end? And we read in 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destructions of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. And we'll study that out next week. It'll be a very inspiring sermon. But we look at this passage, and sometimes we think, when is the Lord going to return? You ever just wanted Jesus to return? Yes. It's like you've done with it. Now, if you don't, you know, you might need to look into your own heart. What's wrong, right? I've been there, too. Uh, one time I was laying in my bed in Portland, Oregon, and I'd been in a lot of sin. 
and I'm just laying there to take a nap. And you know when you kind of like drift off, it's like you're dreaming, but you're not? Yeah. It was like really weird. And all of a sudden, I just, in, in my head, I just heard this. I was terrified. Like, I literally thought, this is it. I'm so sorry. You know, I, I think about those things. And that kind of came to my side. I woke up and I said, oh, praise God. Anytime I'm in a plane, I, I always get a little nervous at the landing. I don't know why. Just one of those things, you know, I, I always, and I always confess my sin while we're laughing. <laughs> I always, always start praying. God, I just thought, you know, I was just praying, you know, I, I just, and then I hit. And I remember one time, you guys ever been to the LaGuardia Airport in New York? And they have that landing strip that goes out in the water? And there's a plane like the week before that like landed in the Hudson or something, I don't remember. But, but, and so I'm like flying on this thing and that's going down. And all I see is just water, people like, coming closer, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is it. <laughs> We're like, crash landed, maybe they're just not telling us to keep us all calm or whatever. <laughs> and I was freaking out. And there's times like that, you kind of go, man, where am I at, Spirit? Right. Yeah. And we landed, it was fine, you know, I realized. Was like, you know. God is patient in returning because he wants all men to come to repentance. He loves us. And I love how it says we can speed his coming. That's an interesting thought. We can speed the coming by evangelizing the world in this generation. That's an interesting thought, is it not? And I hope the world can be evangelized in our time. You know, today, wherever you're at spiritually, I want you to remember Jesus was on that cross. And he simply said those words, it is finished. You can take confidence in the blood of Christ. You can take confidence that your sin is finished. It's done. And one day, this world of hardship and pain that we live in will be totally destroyed, and we'll get to be with God and the new heaven and the new earth. Let's go and bring as many to, many men, amen, to that breakfast this Saturday morning so we can have more souls, and we can be welcomed into eternal dwellings. To God be the glory, amen.